Okay, this is section 3.3 .3 on linear programming. Okay, let's start with these definitions. Linear programming is a method to achieve the best outcome, such as maximum profit or lowest cost, in a mathematical model whose requirements are represented by linear relationships. So, it, in short, it has nothing to do really uh, with computer programming, although you'll often solve linear programming problems using a computer program, um, it's, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with programming per se. The main idea is that you're optimizing, you're trying to find the optimum solution to some problem, and the thing is though is that you're subject to constraints, so your solution must satisfy some uh, known constraints, okay? And that's the next definition. The constraints are the restrictions or limitations on the variable. Okay, the objective function is the function that we seek to maximize or minimize while restricted to the constraints of the problem. So optimize, it could be maximize or minimize. The feasible region shows graphically the set of possible solutions to the linear programming problem. So the feasible region is just the, the possible solutions to the problem, okay? And our goal is to search through those possible solutions and find the best one, the optimal one. And we'll see that uh, that can be done. Okay, so a typical problem is to maximize the profit function here. P is equal to 30x plus 40y, subject to the constraints here. So um, <clears throat> we have a, a key idea is that you're in order for this to all work, we have to we we have to have linear. Okay, so hence the the word linear and linear programming. Both are objective function, in this case, the profit function, the, the function we wish to maximize, and the constraints have to be linear. Okay, what does that mean? That means that you can have a sum of scaled variables set equal to something or less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to some, some value. Okay, so like here in the profit function, we have 30x plus 40y. Each variable x and y is just to the the power of one. Okay, you can't have any squaring or cubing or square rooting, any kind of other stuff, other functions going on in there. It can just be some number times a variable plus num uh, a coefficient time times your other variables. Okay. Similarly with the constraints. Now, as long as we have this setup, our objective function is linear and the constraints are linear we can apply linear programming. And the next thing here, this theorem of linear programming is really the key. So if a solution exists to a bounded linear programming problem, then it occurs at one of the corner points. So if you look at the diagram down below, uh, on the left here we have a bounded region. So in in mathematics, bounded simply means that a region is bounded if you can draw a circle around the region um, and that circle fully encloses the region, okay? Now, over here, I mean, I can draw a circle around this region, but, but really this region um, extends off infinitely far in the first quadrant there. So the region actually extends beyond this portion. Uh, it extends outwards here and here. So it's really all of this space. So this doesn't, this doesn't work, okay? I can't bound this region on the right. Okay, so the key idea though is that when you do have a bounded region, the the solution 
to your linear programming problem is going to occur at one of these corner points of your bounded region or sometimes they're called the uh, vertex or vertices of the bounded region okay next bullet point here if a feasible region is unbounded then a maximum value for the objective function does not exist so we can't maximize problems where the feasible region is unbounded third if a feasible region is unbounded and the objective function has only positive coefficients then a minimum value exists so we can solve linear programming problems where we're trying to minimize our objective function as long as the um, coefficients are positive okay this will make more sense as we see an example okay here's our first exercise the graph of a feasible region is shown for the following system by system we mean this system of linear inequalities here okay locate the corner points and then find the maximum of the objective function c is equal to 7x plus 2y okay so this is using that that first bullet point in the theorem we just looked at the idea is we have a feasible region here in the xy plane and um, I'm going to explain to you why the, the maximum to this objective function has to be one of these corner points of this region. So what are the corner points of this region? Well, let me get a slightly fatter marker here. So this one is the origin. It's just 0, 0. Up here, this is the point... 0 comma 10 let's see this would be the point let me make this just a little smaller here okay this point is the point 5 comma 8 and this point is the point 8 comma 0 okay so what we want to do now is just plug all of these points into our objective function which is this function here c is equal to 7x plus 2y and we want to see which point will maximize that function okay um, and then I'll explain why I've got this little picture of a topographical map here in just a moment so let's plug these data points in and, and here's the key a key idea I'm gonna think of this function as a function of not just a single variable but as a function with two of two variables or with two inputs so the function is 7x plus 2y okay so now if I plug in 0 0 of course C of 0 comma 0 well this is just 7 times 0 plus 2 times 0 of course that's 0 if I plug in this point 0 10 what do I get I get 7 times 0, which is 0, plus 2 times 10, which is 20. Okay, that's better. That's a bigger number. We're trying to maximize this function, remember. What if I plug in 5 and 8? Let's see. C of 5, comma 8. This is going to be 7 times 5 plus 2 times 8 that's going to be 35 plus 16 which is 45 plus 6 which is 51 um, finally if I plug in the point 8 comma 0 what do I get I get 
7 times 8 plus 2 times 0, which is 56. Okay, and so that's our maximum value we get out of these four corner points of the region. The most we got out was 56. So it was this point right here that maximizes the objective function, this 7x plus 2y function. Why is that? Um, well, let me go back now to this topographic map here. I'll make this a little bit bigger. So what is a topographic topographical map here? A topographical map is simply a map that has what we call contours on it. And these contours, these brown lines that you see on this little diagram here, they represent elevation above sea level or above some level, okay? So we've got like a little river here and a lake. Uh, these would presumably be down in some kind of valley maybe. And then next to this river and lake, we have a, a, a fairly large hill or maybe it's a mountain, I don't know. But you see the brown contours. As you go in this direction, you're going uphill, okay? And as you're going from over here, as you go in this direction, you're going uphill as well, okay? And you can see here, this first contour, this contour here is marked 100. So maybe it's 100 meters above sea level or something. And then as you keep going, you get 200 meters and then 300 meters. It looks like it's some kind of flattened off mesa at the top there. And it's at 300 feet or meters tall. Okay, so the point is, though, is that the contours help us make this two-dimensional map and understand it in a kind of in a three-dimensional way because we also know have now have this idea of altitude above the map via the contours. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing as the contour map using the objective function. The objective function is going to give us contours. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, I have um, I've graphed this region in Desmos. And let me, whoops, let me pull that up here. Okay, so we, you see here I have the same exact region graphed in Desmos and the four vertices of that region. Okay, now over here on the left you see I've got the objective function 7x plus 2y is equal to 0. And now if I turn this on, you see I've got, I've got that red line. So these red lines are my contours, just like the contour map, the contours on the topographical map. And then the next one here corresponds with the line 7x plus 2y equals 10. Okay, so, and then if I keep going here, I've got a whole bunch of these. 7x plus 2y equals 20. 7x plus 2y equals 30. 40, 50. 50, 60, 70, okay, oops, 70. There, so I've got eight different contours laid over this region, and I've covered the entire region with contours now. And the idea is, what is it? Well, as I go, uh, starting maybe at this point zero zero at the origin, as I head off in the um, kind of northeast direction there, a little more like uh, east northeast or something, a little below northeast, right? As I head off in that direction, I'm climbing uphill. Okay, so you should the you should literally think of the objective function as forming a plane above the x y plane. Okay, so think of it as a as a plane that intersects the xy plane at the origin and cuts through the xy plane at the origin um, and then rises up with constant a, a very a constant slope okay but the steepness varies depending upon whether which direction you go in as you go um, 
it's a little steeper as you head off into the east direction than in the, the north direction here. How can I tell that? Because the distance between contours as you head due east on this map, the contours are closer than if you head due north, right? So it's going to be steeper in the east direction, but it's a little even steeper if you go just a little above east, like east-northeast. Okay, now as we can see, um, this first corner lies on the zero contour, okay? So that's obviously that would that would minimize if we are, if our goal was to minimize the objective function that would be the point we want. But um, and then we see the point zero ten goes through the third contour, the seven x plus two y equals twenty in this case. Um, and then we see that the point five eight is just beyond the let's see zero ten twenty thirty forty fifty the fifty contour. But then this point eight zero, it's a little further beyond the 50 contour and closer to the 60 contour, isn't it? And so that's why that point maximizes this objective function because it is highest up on, if we were to go to the, the hill above this region, that point would be the highest point on this, it's, it's really, an eternal slope, right? An eternal hill. It doesn't have a, a top to it. Okay, so that's the basic idea of linear programming when we have just two variables. So when we when we have only two things that can vary, in this case it was it's x and y, we don't know what those variables represent, but when we just have two things that can vary, we can solve these problems problems in a very graphical way, okay? In the next section, we'll examine how do you solve problems with more than just two variables, like three, four, five hundreds of variables, okay? But let's just stick to the simpler cases in this section here. Okay, I'm gonna go back to OneNote, and okay. So the, the, the upshot of this exercise is simply you plug in all of your vertices into your objective function and see which one maximizes or minimizes the the objective function. In this case we wanted to maximize it. Alright, so I've got two more exercises here and we're gonna see how to take a description of a problem and write it up as a linear programming problem. In other words, and a linear programming problem has, has two parts to it. It always has an objective function, the thing you're trying to optimize, and the second part will be the set of constraints, the linear constraints that your solution has to satisfy. So that's what we, we need to come up with. We need to use this description of the, exercise, of the problem and come up with both an objective function and a system of linear constraints that our solution must satisfy. So let's read through this. A store owner sells two types of bikes for kids, a BMX bike and a mountain bike. The store owner pays $100 for BMX bikes and $200 for mountain bikes. BMX bikes sell for $160 and mountain bikes sell for $240. The store owner estimates that no more than 200 bikes will be sold during the summer, and he does not plan to invest more than $24,000 in inventory for these bikes. Okay, in part A here, it says let B be the number of BMX bikes and M be the number of mountain bikes that the store owner orders. Write the objective function to find the maximum revenue for the store owner. So our goal here is to maximize revenue. So what is revenue? Well, <clears throat> the store owner sells a BMX bike for $160 and sells a mountain bike for $240. So the revenue, let me get <clears throat> our revenue as a function of 
the number of BMX bikes and mountain bikes sold will be well he sells BMX bikes for 160 so if we multiply the number of BMX bikes sold by the price per bike $160 per bike then this will give us the revenue from selling BMX bikes and then if we multiply M which represents the number of mountain bikes sold by the price per bike which is $240 we're gonna get the revenue from selling mountain bikes we add this together and we get the total revenue so that's our objective function and we can think of it as a function of two variables and you can even think of it as the output we could call the output Z if we wanted to for like X I'm thinking of like X Y and Z and we think of Z as representing altitude usually okay it doesn't matter I don't have to name the output variable but we can okay so now we need part B we need the set of constraint inequalities so we need to glean this from the description of the problem well um, I think this fact here that the, the store owner estimates that no more than 200 bikes will be sold during the summer means that um, B plus M will be less than or equal to 200 okay and then also there's this so there's this quantity he only gets 200 orders at most during any given summer so so he has this restriction on how much he can sell and then he has another restriction he only has twenty four thousand dollars now to order these bikes and put them into his inventory so um, let's make an, uh, a money constraint here he has the, the the amount he pays to order the bikes has to be less than or equal to twenty four thousand dollars and what is the price he pays he pays a hundred dollar per BMX bike so that would be 100 B and then he pays two hundred dollars per mountain bike so that would be plus two hundred M okay um, so those are the two constraints that we glean from the problem description but of course there's actually two implied constraints the number of of BMX bikes this this has to be greater than or equal to zero you can't have a negative number of, of bikes and then the number of mountain bikes this has to be greater than or equal to zero as well so we have four constraints now our job is to graph these four constraints and um, determine the feasible region okay the set of possible solutions so let's do that next here remember to graph a the solution set to a, a system of linear inequalities what we want to do is maybe rewrite them in slope intercept form and then graph the lines and then shade the region either above or below each line okay so let's see here um, this axis represents the number of BMX BMX bikes so we'll, we'll put this we'll label that with B and the vertical axis here is the number of mountain bikes so we'll label that with M okay now this first um, this inequality here if I solve it for the dependent variable here we're thinking of M is depending upon B it doesn't really matter here but uh, um, as long as we're consistent so if I solve for M I get M is less than or equal to negative B plus 200 all right and then if I similarly if I solve this oh you know what first I'm, I'm gonna simplify this inequality by dividing both sides of the inequality by 100 and then I get B plus 2M 
is less than or equal to 240. Okay, solve this for m, I get 2m is less than or equal to negative b plus 240. Um, and so m is less than or equal to negative 1 half b plus 120. Okay, so these are the two inequalities put into slope intercept form. So I can graph them much more easily. So let's see, let's graph, I'm gonna graph the first one in blue. Let's see, we have the uh, y or m intercept here at 200 and we have a slope of negative one. So I'm also gonna go through this point here. Okay, let's get a ruler out and connect those two points up. You know, I wonder if maybe my zoom level is kind of causing it. That'll work. Okay. Okay, so what I just graphed there was actually the uh, the quantity constraint. Okay, now let's do the money constraint. We'll do that one in green. He only has $24,000 to with which to buy BMX and mountain bikes. So let's plot this one. This one has a Y intercept of, or M intercept of 120. That would be this point right here. And it has a slope of negative one over two. Um, So let's see, as I, as I run two, I have to go down one. I would put me here. Or if I run one big block, I sorry, as I, if I run two big blocks, I've got to go down one big block. So that would put me right here. And run two blocks, go down another block here. And let's see, here. And here, oh, no, that, that last one's wrong. This one would be right here. Okay, well, let's get a ruler out. Connect these points up. All right. Okay, and since both of these um, are less than or equal to inequalities, I, I want the region below the line. So let me shade this one with some green cross hatching here below the line. You could also check a test point like the origin and you'll see the origin satisfies both of these inequalities because zero is less than or equal to 200 and 0 is less than 120 so and if I shade for the other region I get this okay and so then the region we care about is I'm not gonna graph the other inequalities. Let's see here, it looks like it's, I think it's this point right there. Um, yeah, so the region, the feasible region is this red region in here. All right. So the region I've outlined in red is the feasible region. Let's get the corners of this region. This corner is, this one is at, let's see, that's at 0, 120. This corner, of course, is the origin, 0, 0. This corner down here is at, um, 
comma zero. And then this corner right here, I believe, is at, I kind of made a mess of my graph here. That's at 160 and 40. I could solve the system of linear equations to check to make sure that that is correct. Um, or I could just plug it into both of the inequalities and make sure I, I hit the equal part, right? So let's see, if I plug 160 and 40 for B and M into the first inequality, I get, yeah, 160 plus 40 is 200, 200 is equal to 200. When I plug in, uh, you know, instead of plugging it into this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug into this right here. I'm gonna plug in 160 for B and 40 for M into that. And let's see, I get 160 plus 80. Yeah, 160 plus 80 is 240. That checks out. So this point is the point 160, 40. Um, sometimes you'll have to, it won't be so nice, you know, and, and it won't uh, be easy to tell exactly what the coordinates of the point are. In that situation, you have to use the techniques from chapter two to solve the system of equations, the two equations that give that point and, and solve precisely for the, that, that point of intersection. Okay, so we've graphed the feasible region now. Our solution has to be in this red polygon this red four-sided polygon. We know that. And what we want to do is find the corner of this region that maximizes revenue. So what do we do? All we have to do, the, the, the key theorem of linear programming is that the, the point that satisfies or that maximizes or minimizes the uh, the objective function will be at one of these corner points. It won't be in the inside of the region. It's going to be at one of the most extreme corners of the region. So now we're going to plug these four points that bound the feasible region into the objective function. What was the ob objective function? It's 160b plus 240m. Okay, so let's see, what is the revenue? Just for um, completeness sake, I'll, I'll do it for the, the origin as well. This would be, of course, 160 times zero plus 240 times zero, which will, of course, just be zero. And now let's see, what is the revenue if we purchase zero BMX bikes, but 120 mountain bikes. So that will be 160 times zero plus 240 times 120. Let's see here, 240 times 120, 240, times 120, 28,800. You know what, let's uh, get these next to each other so I can more easily use the calculator. 28,800, okay. Let's see, let's plug in this next point, 160.40. So, I guess I'll do it here. Revenue at 160 BMX bikes, 40 mountain bikes. So this would be 160 times 160 plus 240 times 40. What is that equal to? Let's see, so 160 times 160 plus 240 times 40. Did I do that correct? Oh, I made a mistake here. This should be a one. 
Okay. $35,200. Finally, let's plug in this last point, which has coordinates 200 comma zero, and see the revenue. So the revenue, when we do 200 BMX bikes and zero mountain bikes, this will be 160 times 200 plus 240 times zero, which will be 160 times 200 $32,000. All right, so we see that the point that maximizes revenue is this point here, that vertex or corner of the feasible region. So this store owner should should purchase 160 BMX bikes and 40 mountain bikes. Okay, let's move on then. Okay, here's another example. Let me put the calculator away for a moment. You need to buy some filing cabinets. Cabinet X costs $10 per unit, requires six square feet of floor space, and holds eight cubic feet of files. Cabinet Y costs $20 per unit, requires eight square feet of floor space, and holds 12 cubic feet of files. You have been given $140 for this purchase though you don't have to spend that much. The office has room for no more than 72 square feet of cabinets. How much of each model should you buy in order to maximize storage volume? Okay, so what I've done here is extracted the information in the table, sorry, in the the description into a table so it's a little easier here to think about so cabinet X costs ten dollars per unit it requires six six uh, square feet of area or floor space and it will hold eight cubic feet of files and then model Y here it's more expensive it costs twenty dollars per unit it requires a little more square footage eight square feet but it holds 12 cubic feet of files. Okay, so our goal here is to, um, and that's this key last phrase here, maximize storage volume. Okay, so you always, when looking at a description of a linear programming problem, you wanna figure out, well, what is, that's the, your first goal is to figure out what are we trying to optimize here? Are we trying to maximize something or minimize something? And what is that something? Okay, so we're trying to minimize, sorry, maximize volume. So I'm going to use V for my objective function. Um, I'm going to say, let's see, V, uh, we're we're told to use uh, lowercase x and lowercase y to be the number of model x cabinets and the number of model y cabinets. That makes sense. So let's see here. Um, if I if I buy x cabinets of style of model x, that's going to each one has a volume of eight cubic feet. So if I do 8x, that's going to give me the, the volume of storage I get from those cabinets. And then to that I add um, 12 times y. Because the if, if I buy y of the model y cabinets, each one gives me 12 cubic feet. So that will give me the total storage volume from the model y cabinets. I sum them all together and I get the 
the total volume of storage from both types of cabinets. So there we go, there's the objective function. Part B, complete the following system of constraint inequality. So this first number, 140 here, comes from this in the problem description. You have been given $140 for this purchase, though you don't have to spend that much. So we want to spend less than or equal to $140. And how much am I going to be spending? Well, this, this cost call column tells me um, I'm going to be spending 10x for the X style cabinets. So 10x, that's how much I'll spend buying those. And then $20 per model Y cabinet. So 10x plus 20Y has to be less than or equal to 140. And then this 72 here comes from this in the problem. The office has room for no more than 72 square feet of cabinets. Okay. And I can use this column here to get my total area from square footage of, of floor space that the cabinets need. So each X cabinet requires six square feet so the square footage from the model X cabinets will be 6x the square footage from the model Y cabinets they require 8 square feet per cabinet so 8y okay so um, there we go of course we have the implied constraints that X must be uh, non-negative and y must also be non-negative. Actually we also have um, another constraint here and that is that x and y have to be whole numbers. Okay you can't I, I presume you probably can't buy half of a model x cabinet okay and you you know I, I would bet for sure that you can't buy you know, something like 12 seventeenths of a Model X cabinet, okay? Um, so the point is, is that X and Y also have the added constraint here that they need to be integers and, and not just in, any old integer. They need to be positive integers. So um, just so you're aware of it, linear programming has this subfield called integer programming where your solutions must have integer cons they must take on integer values um, and this is an example of an integer programming problem and um, this just adds another twist into the, the problem um, but really we're gonna see here it doesn't really affect much of anything but the solution space is actually diminished quite a bit but really again we only need to worry about the corners of our feasible region. Okay, um, so we want to graph the feasible region. Okay, I'm going to get rid of these right here and I'm going to solve these two inequalities for y. So let's see, what do I get here? I get, for the first one I get, oh you know what, before I do that I'm just going to divide everything by 10 and I get x plus 2y is less than or equal to 14. That's a much nicer inequality to work with. And then uh, everything in the next inequality is divisible by 6. Oh no, it's not. It's divisible by 2. Everything's divisible by 2. So I could rewrite this as 3x plus 4y is less than or equal to 36, right? Half of 72 is 36. Okay, and now I'm going to solve these for y. Let's see, I get 2y is less than or equal to negative x plus 14. So y, let me get rid of these, is less than or equal to negative one-half x plus seven. 
There's our first inequality. Solve this second inequality for y, I get 4y is less than or equal to negative 3x plus 36. So y is less than or equal to negative 3 fourths x plus 36 divided by 4 is 9. There we go. Okay, so I've transformed the inequalities into slope-intercept form, and I can plot these much more easily now. Let's see. So the first inequality is our cost inequality. I'm going to use the green for that one. So let's see here. We have a y-intercept of 7 and a slope of negative one-half. So as I run two, I descend one. So here, 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 and there. Okay. Let's connect those dots up with, let me make this a little bit so I can fit it all on the one screen. And okay. Next, we have negative three quarter x plus nine. So we have a y intercept of nine and a slope of negative three quarters. So as I run four, I have to descend three. So one, two, three, four, descend one, two, three, that's this point. Run four, one, two, three, four, descend three, one, two, three, oop, this is where they intersect right here. And then run four, one, two, three, four, descend one, two, three, that's here at 12. Okay. work. Okay. And recall both of these inequalities were of the type less than or equal to. So I want to shade everything below. Um, let's do this with vertical lines with the green one. And we'll use horizontal lines for the blue region to cross hatch. Okay, I guess that's not really necessary, but. And then, of course, our feasible region will be this point down to the origin, down to this point at 12, 0 and this point right here. So it'll be roughly this polygon. Okay, let's label these vertices. This is the point let's get a darker marker here. This is the point zero seven. 0, 0. Let's see, this point has coordinates of uh, 8, 3. And this one has coordinates of 12, 0. OK. So that's part of part D, locate the corner points of the feasible region and find the maximum storage volume. So we want to plug, oops, didn't, there we go. That's our feasible region. Now, 
notice that the uh, vertices or corners of this feasible region are into the, the, their coordinates are integer pairs. So um, the point is though is that sometimes when you do a program like this where your constraints you have to do um, your 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 variables have to take on only integer values. Um, often your region, the feasible region you get, won't necessarily the out the the, the boundary of it or the border won't go through integer points like it does here. In other words, the vertices may not be integer have integer coordinates, right? And so you have to look at the points inside. But we're going to kind of gloss over the, the difficulties that, that integer programming adds to the whole situation here. So really, though, the solution is not every single point in here, but you know every single point on this lattice of points like this, all of these points. But the points in between are not valid possible solutions, are they? OK. But we're not going to give you problems where you have to worry about that. So our corners, our vertices are integer points. So we can just plug them in and into our objective function. What was our objective function? It was 8x plus 12y. It was for volume, and we want to maximize it. So we need to plug all these points into the 8x plus 12y uh, function. So let's plug in, um, obviously we're trying to maximize, so I'm not even going to plug in the origin. Let's see, the volume at 0, 7, this will be 8 times 0 plus 12 times 7. Let's see, this is 12 times 7, this is 70 plus 14, which would be 84. So 84 cubic feet of volume if we buy seven type Y cabinets. What if we buy a mixture? What if we buy eight type X cabinets and three type Ys? Well, we're going to have eight times eight plus 12 times three. 64 plus 36, that's 100 cubic feet of volume. Finally, we'll plug in if we buy 12 Model X cabinets and 0 Model Y cabinets, we're going to have 8 times 12 plus 12 times 0. 8 times 12 is 80 plus 16, which is 96. So in this case, a mixture of eight type X cabinets or model X and three model Y cabinets will accomplish the goal of maximizing volume for us. Okay, in the next section, we're going to look at how to use Excel to solve more complicated linear programming problems. Admittedly, these were all kind of toy examples, okay? Um, and we'll see you next time. This concludes section 3.3. .3.